Hi, this is Linda Boyle. I am the professor and chair in industrial and systems engineering, and I wanna thank you very much for coming today. I just wanna start off with an overview of industrial and systems engineering. For those of you who do not know, ISCs examine the entire system to make sure that people and things move well together. Some people would actually say that the history of industrial engineering began with these two individuals, Frank and Lillian Gilbreth, who were active in the early to mid 1900s. They actually took efficiency to the extreme and they even inspired the movie Cheaper by the Dozen, which was made in 1950 with Myrna Loy. And one of the things that was a popular story associated with him was that he took efficiency to the extreme that he even used two razors to shave because he thought that would cut the time in half. However, he came to realize that because he wasn't as precise, he had to stop because the time to apply a bandage after the cuts was actually inefficient and took more time. So he went back to one razor. And Lillian Gilbreth, his wife, was also very famous in her own right. She was the first working female engineer that held a PhD. She is the first woman in the National Academy of Engineering. And she is member number one in the Society of Women Engineers. The history of the industrial engineering at the University of Washington began in 1946. Um, the UW catalog included a new fifth year program for a BSIE program. And in 1947, the commencement bulletin actually showed that there were two uh, recipients that got the BSIE degree. In 1986, the Bachelor's of Science in Industrial Engineering program was accredited. And in 1995, the Master's of Science in Industrial Engineering was approved. And in 98, the PhD was approved. In the year 2009, we became a department, the Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering. And in 2014, we opened up a professional master's program for uh, those who work in industry. And as of 2020, we have awarded over 2,200 degrees. So just to give you a couple of department updates, uh, we are now at 14 faculty with 50% of the faculty being female. We have our specialty in three areas, um, operations research, applied statistics, production systems, and human factors. In operations research, uh, we focus on optimizing solutions for complex decision-making problems, for applied statistics production systems, we look at improving the overall quality through data monitoring and analysis. And in the human factors area, we design systems that work with humans that are safe and efficient. We actually take those methods and apply it into many different areas, anywhere from healthcare to transportation, manufacturing alternative resources, as well as disaster recovery and preparedness. This past year, we have um, 234 students that are enrolled in our program. Of those, 144 are undergraduate students with 68% being Washington State residents and 12% being international students. 90 graduate students with 28 in the PhD program, 14 in the master's and 48 doing the professional master's program. Right now, this past year, we've been teaching remotely. And so since this has been going on since March of 2020, where we have been 100% remote instructions and our faculty have actually gotten very acclimated to teaching virtually. They have been provided various Zoom tutorials. They have integrated whiteboard features as part of their lectures and they've done more interactive sessions as well as incorporated breakout groups so that students can get to know each other. In addition, they've been leverage, uh, leveraging a lot of available online resources that has um, been done to complement what they've been doing on Zoom. We have um, continued to get a lot of companies that work with us on the senior capstone projects. And this is um, a list of the many companies that have worked with us over the past few years. And our vision for growth is to basically raise the profile and the impact of ISE. And we wanna do that by serving our students recruiting and retaining high quality faculty and providing world-class facilities. We serve our students by having scholarships and fellowships and re recruiting and retaining high quality faculty by making sure that we have endowed chairs and professorships and providing world-class facilities 
by striving to have excellent research labs, undergraduate space, and space for faculty, staff, and students so they can be in close proximity. And I wanna thank all of you who have contributed to the department. We could not have done it without you. And with that, I just wanna say thank you very much for attending this presentation. And with that, I'm gonna um, move it on to our next presenter. Thank you very much. So at this time, I would like to introduce Professor Prashant Rajivan. He is an assistant professor in industrial and systems engineering working in cybersecurity. Hello, uh, and thanks for uh, joining us for this uh, virtual uh, lab visit. Um, as Linda introduced, uh, I'm Prashant. Um, I'm an assistant professor in the department. Um, and the, the lab I lead uh, is called BRICS and it stands for um, Laboratory for Behavioral Research um, in Information and Computer Security. Um, so uh, I'm personally interested in human factors in general. Uh, but particularly, I'm interested in studying uh, how people make decisions, uh, particularly in environments where um, they are adversarial in nature uh, and where people have to make um, decision making and judgments um, under uncertainty. Uh, we are looking at both how people make decisions as individuals uh, in these contexts uh, and also as a group um, when they're trying to make as part of a team or a group. So uh, the goal of our lab um, is at a overall to advance the science of cybersecurity, uh, particularly the human factor science of cybersecurity. Uh, and we are trying to find uh, ways, uh, solutions and, uh, and, and policies uh, that can improve uh, cyber defense operations and, and cyber defense technologies um, through human systems engineering principles. So some of the work uh, that we're doing is currently done, uh, is currently funded by Starbucks and also Nest, um, but we're definitely open for more funding. Um, so um, if you're interested uh, in collaborating with us, please uh, reach out to us. Um, so to start off, um, I want to introduce the topic of cybersecurity. Um, I don't have to um, uh, explain a lot because I think a lot of this is already in the news. Um, and some of the clips I've shown you are from some of the recent news on, on big uh, cyber attacks. Uh, so cyber attacks, as you all know, um, is growing. Um, it's growing both in number and also in sophistication. Uh, we are seeing more and more uh, state-sponsored attacks, um, like the recent one that affected a lot of the government agencies as part of the solar winds attack. Um, and, uh, and the attacks are pretty much impacting every aspect of our individual lives, um, from the way healthcare is delivered to us, to, to how energy is delivered to us, to our personal privacy, and also to personal finances. And when we think about um, cybersecurity, People often think of it as a, as a technical problem or as a software problem or as a hardware problem. But in reality, it is a, a socio-technical problem um, or a human factor problem because humans are at the center of cybersecurity as both the problem and also the solutions. So when you think about it, humans are the adversaries uh, who are actively uh, trying to gain access into our systems who are uh, constantly uh, uh, looking into how the different ways that they can break into our networks and, and steal our information or steal our money. Uh, and humans are also the, uh, are the end users of the machines or the computers or the networks who often fall uh, victims to some of these attacks. And humans are also the people uh, who work uh, behind many of these organizations to actively monitor uh, for such attacks. So, uh, so humans touch every aspect of a, a cybersecurity problem. So to improve cybersecurity, to improve cybersecurity processes and to improve cybersecurity technology, we need to look at humans and we need to take into account uh, the humans into consideration. Uh, particularly, uh, we need to understand how people make decisions in these contexts because a lot of times uh, the human adversary um, uh, are exploiting um, the, the gaps or errors that humans make uh, to gain access into the system. And uh, increasingly, regular users of the computers and regular users of the networks 
are uh, expected uh, to be wary of such attacks, which is quite challenging to be honest, because um, this is not what we do on a daily basis. Um, and this is not what most of us are uh, trained to understand and detect. So it gets, a, it gets more and more challenging uh, with time and with new kinds of attacks that are emerging. So I wanna talk about uh, two example problems within cybersecurity, which sort of um, uh, explains this better. Um, so the first one I wanna introduce you to is phishing because this is a kind of attack that most of us are familiar with. So, uh, the, so a phishing attack is where an attacker, um, instead of trying to exploit a, techno, a technical vulnerability, is trying to uh, exploit a human vulnerability to gain access to either our uh, finances or to our information or to probably our credentials. So, and phishing is actually one of the most oldest form of cyber attack. It's been there for around last 20 years. Um, and and it's one of the most widespread kind of attack. So, uh, and in a phishing attack, uh, it's typically involves an attacker sending a message either in the form of an email message or a social media message or a text message. Uh, and this usually involves attacker impersonating someone you know uh, or a brand that we are familiar with or some sort of a governmental agency. And this is usually to gain the trust of the recipient uh, into paying attention to the message that they receive. And furthermore, uh, within a phishing attack, these attackers are trying to find ways uh, to influence our decision-making. And they typically use many of the social influence techniques like um, uh, claiming some sort of issue with your account, claiming uh, you have access to a large sum of money, and it can go uh, in different directions. And one common example is a scam um, that you often, uh, often come across, like a phone scam where people calling you to say that you have some money left that you might be able to access. Or with recent, with COVID times, um, you see this in different forms where the attackers are not trying to um, sort of tap into our fears, um, uh, claiming that uh, there, is, uh, there is openings for a vaccination center or there is access to uh, uh, some cure. Um, so they try to prey on our immediate fears and immediate needs um, into getting us um, to respond to these uh, attacks. And the reasons to do that are many. Uh, an attacker could be sending a phishing message either to um, uh, gain access to your bank accounts or they, they could be sending these messages to steal your identity or to simply install uh, a malware in your machine where you're not the target of the, the attack, but then the goal is to uh, access some other machines within your organizational networks. So, uh, so the question here is, at a, from a human factors point of view, um, is why do people fall uh, to such phishing attacks? It's not that everyone falls attacks to every kind of phishing attack. It's just that um, some people fall attacks to a certain types of attacks. So the question is, why do people fall to certain kinds of attacks and not the others? Um, what are the cognitive processes that is involved uh, behind uh, the susceptibility? Um, and how can we improve or how can we help people make better recognition and better decisions? Another example, which is sort of related uh, to phishing is misinformation. Um, and uh, this is again, is something that every one of us are familiar with or, or are impacted directly or indirectly. Uh, with misinformation um, uh, on social media, you, you have actors, either state sponsored or people with certain kinds of political affiliations are sending out these rumors um, where the goal is instead of trying to get you to do a certain uh, bad action, the goal here is to make you believe a certain thing that is, that is not true or partially not true or completely not true. Uh, so misinformation is some sort of inaccurate information um, that is believed by a large majority of population. And this is often seen in, in online social networks because you have these uh, networks um, that are sort of susceptible to these kinds of um, influence campaigns or influence attacks. Where, uh, but, but when you think about misinformation, it's a much more deeper sort of attack because 
here the attacker is not trying to get you to do one bad action but then have you believe um of of some concept or some notion at a deeper level uh, for example you have some from from recent covid issues you have um misinformation that's claiming uh cure in the form of garlic or or uh, other kinds of uh, hydrochloroquine or consuming hydrochloroquine uh, could be a cure uh to uh misinformation about vaccination and mask use so again similar to questions about phishing you have questions in misinformation is uh why do people fall uh prey to these or fall victims to these misinformation attacks uh what are the cognitive processes that's involved um in these uh in their susceptibility and again the question is how do we develop solutions to improve or help people uh recognize misinformation when they come across one so uh so when we look at it at a fundamental level um we can characterize many of these problems as decision making and judgment and recognition uh under uncertainty uh where we are as people expected uh to detect and recognize uh malicious signals and many of these malicious signals are could be textual uh in nature like in phishing and misinformation and these are signals that have some kind of malicious intent and often use deception and to detect uh such uh attacks or to detect such signals uh suspicion is an important driver because unless you become suspicious of it there is no way that you're going to recognize that it's a it's a malicious signal and when we think about suspicion and how does suspicion emerges um it mostly emerges from our past experiences from our memory and we rely on our uh, memories engaging with such malicious signals in the past to detect uh when we come across a novel kind of malicious signals so this is the area that we are focusing on we are trying to understand the cognitive process um that people use while trying to retrieve memories of uh, related experiences to recognize and detect a malicious signal now this malicious signal could be a phishing message it could be uh, a misinformation or it could be from an uh, uh, a defender point of view could be signals that they use to detect attacks in an organization so this is the focus of our lab so we are trying to understand um how people detect malicious signals in general uh how do people encode search and process malicious signals in their environment what are their underlying cognitive processes what is the role of human trust and suspicion how does human and machines can work together in this context to to improve their performance uh and again developing how can we develop solutions to improve human ability to recognize such malicious signals so this is our lab uh we're still a small lab we're trying to grow um and uh, all of us are working on these uh different challenges uh mainly we are trying to model and understand the socio cognitive factors of judgment and decision making in cybersecurity um and to give you a sort of a small sneak peek of the general methods that we use in the lab is uh we typically start by uh understanding uh the context so for example we start by understanding how does phishing work uh what are the different kinds of attacks uh and how people could be falling so developing hypothesis of how people might be falling susceptible uh to such attacks and this could involve any kind of data analytic techniques or qualitative analysis to understand and build assumptions about our context and based on that uh we do two things one of it is to develop synthetic task environments which allows us to conduct uh experiments in the lab uh with human subjects about that particular context and the other thing is to develop computational models of how people could be making decisions in these contexts and these models are typically driven uh by established models of cognition such as actar and ibl and now using these models we run simulation experiments and we also run uh experiments in the lab uh with human subjects uh trying to understand uh, uh some of these issues now the data from both the lab uh experiments that we conduct with human subjects and the lab and the data that we get from our computational simulations are used to inform uh our findings and some of our understanding about these issues 
And we and this is a cycle. So we go around this cycle many times. Um, we start with a problem, we test it out in the lab, we test it out with the model, and then we go back and see how our assumptions hold and if we need to make changes to the model. So this is our approach. Um, and, uh, and I'm gonna let two of my students describe their research. Uh, and I'm gonna ask Daniel to start by talking about his research on spear phishing attacks. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Daniel Xu, a first year PhD student. Uh, I got my master's degree in the SE department in 2020 and continued as a PhD student. Uh, my work combines machine learning and uh, simulation modeling to develop machine learning tools to facilitate better human decision makings. Uh, I'm going to present a work we did recently, uh, Spear Sim, Synthetic Task Enrichment for Studies on Spear Phishing Attacks. So the goal for this work are trying to understand what makes people vulnerable for these phishing attacks, specifically on how personal information affects their end user susceptibilities and how to model end user decision making. Uh, for example, we don't know how the information we put on LinkedIn, Facebook could be used by attackers and drive the end user's decision making. Uh, from practical application views, we want to understand how to develop embedded training to increase the security awareness. Uh, there is still lack of research in spear phishing because spear phishing email is always related to personal information and there is no open source, um, social, uh, open source spear phishing data set. So we designed an ad adversarial multiplayer game framework to address this problem. Uh, Spear sim is used to simulate the task involved in spear phishing attacks. It's a four player simulation game and three participants plays the role of end user and perform an email management task on behalf of their fictional role. This is a standard approach used in phishing studies and unknown to them, one participant plays the role of an attacker. Their task is to create phishing emails targeting the other end users in the group. Uh, so all of these are simulation attacks and uh, no real harm to the participants. To, simu to simulate these scenarios, uh, we use end-drawn data sets to provide rational background for both uh, profile information and legitimate emails. Uh, let's see a demo then. Attacker are given a goal and a sample phishing email to work with. They customize the attack using the information about the target. We capture how the attacker personalized the attack, uh, specifically who did they choose to impersonate and what social influence feature they used. After drafting the spear phishing email messages, the attack is then sent to the end user who is performing an email management task. And, and the, the task is making decisions on the messages uh, present to them and the uh, emails is just uh, uh, shown as a regular email without notifying to them. Uh, the end user makes decisions on, it's just like the other emails. Uh, so back to the attacker side, this response is sent back as a feedback to attackers. And this cycle continues for a few rounds. We simulate spear phishing attacks end to end in the lab and collect a variety of performance and statistical measurements uh, to study how the attackers would personalize the phishing attacks. Uh, this will help us understand how to improve the training. Uh, we found as more information available to attacker and user are more vulnerable to these spear phishing attacks. Uh, besides, end user vulnerability is also varied with topics. Uh, people are found more vulnerable with attacks exploit their personal information about their workplace. And people are less vulnerable about the attacks, the, the attacks impersonating banks. So one example shown in this slide, uh, the attacker used the professional information to impersonate an IT person uh, in the corporation to ask them to click on the link. Uh, and in the future, we would like to use the data from the experiment to build uh, cognitive models and deep learning models 
uh, to study the cognitive process and the linguistic factors uh, impact on their decision making. And also we want to develop more personalized and, and uh, adaptive solutions to decrease the fishing risk. Uh, that's all for my presentation and uh, I would pass the mic to uh, Archana. Uh, hello, I'm Archana, a second year PhD student in the ISC department. I graduated with a master's degree from the same department three years back. I worked in the industry for a while and uh, decided to return back for my PhD. I've been studying the area of misinformation in the BRICS lab. Uh, misinformation is an all too familiar problem for those of us with a social media account. We are constantly having to navigate and decide whether something is fact or fiction or fake. Uh, sometimes we even have to protect our family and friends uh, from believing fake news. Uh, we extend the research methods that we have seen in the BRICS lab uh, to problems in this area because we've seen some parallels in mechanisms. And uh, we think that the methodologies that are applied in the BRICS lab will apply here even though the impact on this problem and in this context is totally different. So in our research, we split the study of misinformation management systems into that of studying user behavior and of studying the social media environment itself. Particularly our objective is to study the various misinformation diffusion mechanisms and to quantify their impact. Uh, we use data analysis for this part of the research. We are also studying the effect of various interventions that are used to address misinformation by social media organizations and how they impact user behavior. Uh, we are using human factors experiments for this portion of the research. Finally, we want to see how these two aspects interplay and impact the society and the social media organization itself. We use agent-based simulation modeling for this part of, this, of research. So this slide shows a juxtaposition of uh, the current body of research as pertaining to human factors in the area of misinformation versus what we are doing in the BRICS lab. Uh, while there are several publications currently that perform cognitive evaluation of user behavior uh, 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 when they are subjected to different interventions that correct misinformation, there have not been many attempts at quantifying these behaviors. Our primary objective with these human factors experiments have been to quantify the behaviors so that we can use the results into an agent-based simulation model. Uh, we achieve quantification by varying the frequency of corrective actions and correspondingly looking at the impact in different control groups. In this slideshow, we have a snapshot from one of our human factors experiments. On the left, uh, there is an example where the user chooses a wrong action, which in this context was to amplify misinformation by, by some way. And they get immediate corrective feedback dressed as a fact check, uh, fact check organization's tweet saying that uh, there was something wrong with what they did and uh, showing facts about the claim that was addressed in that tweet. And similarly, on the right, we have another case where the user did the right thing by spreading information. And here they get reinforcement from the same organization that they did the right thing and uh, more facts about that claim so that the user is reinforced in a positive way about what they did. Um, in the next arm of research, which is studying uh, the environment of social media through data analysis, our research places importance in aggregating user behavior. Uh, right, uh, right now, in the current body of research, there are several publications that focus on automating the whole process of identification of misinformation through use of natural language processing. Uh, we, we use these tools, such as natural languages, uh, language processing, and apply that to aggregate information about user behavior, so that, again, these can be insights that will go into designing the agent-based simulation model and how we design the users in the agent-based simulation model. And uh, the results from this analysis also intends to validate uh, the results from the agent-based simulation model that we will uh, be developing. Next, finally, we incorporate the findings from the human factors experiments and the social media analysis into an agent-based model. Traditionally, this body of work incorporates an SIR model, which is essentially modeling information or misinformation spread 
as a disease propagation. Uh, but this method excludes a lot of complexities in human behavior. That is, uh, for a, one one example is that it does not take into account that we learn from our mistakes and we try to not repeat the same mistakes again. Uh, so uh, our solution to this was to incorporate a cognitive model within each agent as opposed to a plain uh, disease propagation probability, uh, which enables them to learn from their past mistakes through memory and uh, they take the best decision which they know increases their utility and uh, from their experiences the best decision to take so that was uh, that was the presentation from our BRICS lab thank you for your patience and thank you for listening to all of us that's the end of our presentation i want to thank all of you for attending thank you very much and i look forward to seeing you all on campus thank you bye